and make your church stronger as a result of learning from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. We can see that now. We come back to Matthew chapter 7. Actually, we're getting through and almost getting to the end. And these studies we're having at the end, the conclusion of Matthew chapter 7, the very, very important for you and for me. Let's look at Matthew chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but in what lay their ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns, or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Now verse 19. Every tree. Notice that, underline the word, every in your Bible. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, is cut down, and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits it shall know them. You will see that the Lord here is concentrating on false prophets. Actually, when you look at your New Testament, those two words, false prophets, they come out seven times. And of the seven times that you have the use of those words, false prophets, in the New Testament, only two times were actually used by others, five times by the Lord Jesus Christ, once by Peter, and was by John. Let's look at this. In Matthew chapter 7 verse 15. Beware of false prophets. There you find the Lord Jesus Christ for the first time. In the New Testament you see those words. False prophets. And the first time those words come out. The Lord Jesus Christ said beware. If you see poison will you drink it? No. Beware. If you see a rattlesnake coming your way, would you wait for the rattlesnake to bite you, sting you, and then put the poison, deadly poison in your body? No. Then beware of false prophets. Would you want to wait for somebody that will crush your brain and crush your life and destroy you and make you to lose your life prematurely? No. Then beware of false prophets. They are dangerous. They are deadly. They are damnable. And therefore Jesus Christ said, Beware of false prophets. We come to Matthew chapter 24, verse 11. Matthew 24, I'm reading verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. In this second mention of the false prophet, Jesus Christ said, They will arise. That means they might not have been there before. Maybe when you were born, when you were born again, they were not in your community. Before you get too old, they will arise. Maybe at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ, with those disciples following after him, Peter, James, John, Matthew, Bartholomew, the rest of them, and Philip, they didn't see too many false prophets, but Jesus said they will arise. And then it says they shall deceive many. And the Lord is telling us and warning us ahead of time that false prophets will come. False prophets will arise. The third time Jesus Christ mentioned those words, false prophets, you'll find in verse 24. Matthew 24, verse 24. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders 
Have you noticed that every time the Lord Jesus mentioned the false prophets, he added a little bit of information, revelation, concerning what those false prophets will be, what they will do. He started by their appearance. They have sheep's clothing. And then talked about their nature. They will be roaming in wolves within. And then he went on to say about their offshoot. How they will come. They will arise. And then the result of what they will do. They will deceive many. Now he's telling us that they are not just going to deceive many ordinarily by their talk. Because, you see, if you, if you look at, you know, all the other references, it will look like they will be orators. They will have impressive personalities. And then there will be people that are very aggressive and very effective. But now the Lord Jesus is saying beyond all that, they will have some superhuman powers. And he'll have some signs and wonders and miracles. That's why it says in verse 24, it says they shall show great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Now the fourth time, you're looking at Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 22. Mark chapter 13, verse 22. For false cries and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders. You know, these uh, false prophets we're talking about, uh, they'll not be quiet people, they'll not be reserved people, they'll not be timid people, fearful people, people behind the curtain, people that will not show themselves. They'll be demonstrative people. And there will be people that will come to the open and they will show their colors, they will show who they are. And in fact, they will try to compete with the faithful true prophets of God. And Jesus Christ said they will show signs and wonders to seduce. Take that word. Notice that word. To seduce is seduction, it's deception, it's enticement. It's a law made to allure people, to draw people away, to seduce. If it were possible, even the very elect, we're looking at Luke chapter 6, verse 26. Luke chapter 6, verse 26, warn to you, when all men shall speak well of you. The fifth time the Lord is mentioning the false prophets, because it says, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. But a great warning to the preachers of the gospel that we will not be seeking the applause, the accolades, the clapping, the, uh, the well wish, wishes of the people that were preaching to of the world. In fact, Jesus Christ said, a popular preacher is, is going to be a false preacher, a false prophet, a person that all the people of the world are praising. And you know the society, the corrupt and the evil and the sinful and the carnal and the worldly, all those people praising those prophets and preachers and pastors, it says those are the false prophets want you. It says the soul of that preacher, of that prophet, of that pastor is damned. If his goal is to win the praise of the people, won't you? When all men shall speak good, well of you. For so did their fathers to the false prophets. And you know sometimes as you, as you live in this world and you minister, and as you are preaching the gospel, and then you see other people who are preaching the gospel, and then you see that this one is, you know, being praised by the world. That one is praised by the media. That one is praised by society. But that one is even praised by the government. And then if you're not careful, you say, what's happening to our church? What's happening to me as a preacher? Why is it I'm not winning some of these awards as well? And the moment you begin to run after those awards, looking for the praise of men, you're going to compromise the gospel. You're going to become a false prophet. Beware. And your husband too. If your husband is a preacher, watch over your husband. You know when you see your husband beginning to discuss at home, 
You know, I want the world to know me. I want to be popular. I want to be here and there. And I want to win some of these. I want to. When you find your husband talking like that, go back to Luke chapter 6, verse 26, and say, My husband, you want to become a false prophet. Beware. When you find your wife talking about, how oh, is it? We're just in this local assembly, this little church here. And nobody knows us. And with the gifts you have, I'm sure, my husband, if you will reach out there and branch out there, you can do something, and then we'll be able to have our pictures too in the papers, and have our names in the, in the newspapers, and names over the television radio. We want to be known by everybody. Why do we just stay in this little corner, little state, and little region, and little local government, and this little local church, where you find your wife talking like that, you open Luke chapter 6, verse 26. My wife, you want to lead me to become one of those false prophets? Woe unto you. When all men shall speak well of you, for so did they, their fathers, to the false prophets. You find those five times that Jesus Christ himself mentioned five prophets, and he warned his people, he warned the disciples, he warned the children of God. Beware. We're looking at Second Peter chapter two, verse one. Now we find another mention of the false prophet. This is Peter now. Second Peter chapter two, verse one. But there were false prophets. Here you are, also among the people. Even as there shall be false teachers among you, there shall be false teachers among you. False teachers, false prophets, the same thing. False preachers, false prophets, the same thing. False apostles, false prophets, the same thing. False evangelists, false prophets, the same thing. And so Peter reminds us there were in the past false prophets also among the people. Even as there shall be, there shall be, there shall be. Don't you ever think that the truth will be so well known all over the world? That no false prophet will be will, will come anymore. Don't you ever think that the truth will be so effective, prevailing upon all the world that false prophets will not have a place to stand? Never. They'll be there. They, they shall, there were false prophets also among the people. Even as there shall be false teachers among you, what will they do? Who privately, privately shall bring in damnable Heresies. Now you understand what the Lord is warning us against the false prophets. They'll privately, secretly, behind the curtain, they'll bring in damnable heresies. Heresies, messages, doctrines that will be damnable, that will damn your soul. And then it says, and even denying the Lord that bought them. That means then some of them were saved. Some of them were redeemed. Some of them, they had the real joy of salvation many years ago because they were bought with the precious blood of the Lamb. But now they deny, they will deny the Lord that bought them and they will bring upon themselves sweet destruction. First John chapter 4. The seventh time you find those words, false prophets. Those prophets in the plural. In the New Testament, in fact, in the Bible, in First John chapter four, verse one, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. You say, so why do we have a repetition, a multiplicity of all these verses? Don't you see the different shades? And the different revelations we have in all those verses. The Lord Jesus Christ said, Beware, then told you of the appearance and the end of their inward nature. And then the Lord Jesus Christ said, They shall arise, look into the future. And then it says, When they arise, they're going to show great signs and wonders, they're going to demonstrate some miraculous powers. And then later he said, they'll be popular preachers, popular prophets, because everybody will be praising them. 
and then it goes on and, and Peter then tells us they will deny the Lord that bought them giving us now some revelation that they, they will not just be people who never got saved some of them would have been saved but now John tells us because what we've been saying there shall be they will come to you all in the future by the time John was writing he said because many false prophets are gone out into the world that means then from the time of John until now anywhere you go anywhere you turn you find those false prophets by the way why are we so concerned about that why don't we just open other pages of the Bible and leave all these false prophets alone because of their deadly work, because of their damnable heresy, and because of their deceitful approach, and because if we don't get you, they'll try to get your wife. If we don't get you and your wife, they'll try to get your children. If we don't get your family, they'll try to get your converts. And he'll try to privately bring in something that will deceive people, distract people, and turn them away from the truth. And let's look at what false prophets actually do, and why they are so deadly and dangerous and damnable. And you need to avoid them. Acts chapter 13. In Acts chapter 13, I'm reading from verse 6. Acts 13, verse 6. And when they had gone through the Isle of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet. That's in the singular. All those other seven references are read you in the plural. False prophets. That's why I said there are seven. But now you have an example. You have an individual. You have a personality. And then you are told, this one, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar Jesus. But you see behind his name, sorcery witchcraft occultism but you don't see that because you know the name is a good name bad jesus bad jonah means son of jonah bad jesus means son of jesus and then it says which was when the deputy of the country such as paulus a prudent man who called for barnabas and saul and desired to hear the word of god this man wanted to hear the pure word of god the saving word of God, the transforming word of God, the powerful word of God. And he wanted to have that word so that he will see the light and know the light and know how to get to life eternal. But he lies the sorcerer, that's that false prophet now, for so is his name by interpretation, which should them seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. That's the major work of the false prophet. Seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Seeking to turn us away from the truth that saves. These false prophets are also called false, uh, false apostles. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 13. For such a false Apostles, false prophets, false teachers, false apostles. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers. That's why you avoid them. Deceitful workers. And that means then, hey, these are not just, uh, it's not just the international uh, preachers we're talking about. Workers in the church. Deceitful workers. Wanting to turn the minds of people away from the centrality of the truth of the word of God. The saving truth of the word. The sinful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed to the ministers as the ministers of righteousness. That's what they pretend to be. They pretend to be ministers of righteousness, but actually they are false, whose end shall be according to their works. And you know when we're talking about prophets, most of the time your mind will go to men. Do you know women too are involved in this? Revelation chapter 2. 
Revelation chapter 2. So you are not thinking, we're only talking about men, women too. If you pick up the word of God, and then you preach something false, and you deceive the minds of people, and you turn people away from the truth, and you distract the attention of people from the saving truth, sound doctrine. If you're a woman, then you're a false prophetess. Let's look at Revelation chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 19. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and patience, and, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Is that that verse alone is a good commendation for any preacher of the gospel, for any pastor? If you know, if you will have a pastor, if you'll have a preacher, if you'll have a leader, and then the Lord will say, I know thy works, and thy charity, that's your love, and your service, and your faith, and your patience, and your works, and the last will be more than the false. You'll think you have arrived. You say, Praise the Lord. I have commendation from the Lord. See what the Lord is saying about me. But read on. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest that a woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach. Please uh, wait for a moment. Can you look up here for a moment, please? And you know those apostles who are preachers. When they call us preachers, if you look at that word itself, preacher, the word is so limited. You'll think that our responsibility is just to preach. That's all we do. No. You see the person over here, very active, very zealous. I know your faith. I know your service. I know your work. And your last to be, and your last work to be more than the first. And yet, you allow that woman there, Jezebel, to teach. She don't be teaching. You know, there are preachers who are too afraid, too much afraid to confront people. And they cannot say, hey, lady, you cannot teach that here. They are afraid to confront even women. And if they are afraid to confront women, they are afraid to confront men. They cannot challenge people. And they cannot stop somebody that is bringing false doctrine into the church. Oh, they'll say, that, that's, that's not my area. I'm just, I'm here to preach. And once I've done my duty, and I've declared the word, and everybody knows what I preach. Anybody, everybody knows how I sweat, and how I labor, and my service. And nobody can put me down as if I'm a lazy, idle, indolent, careless preacher, pastor. I preach. And that when it comes to check that man, stop him. Check that woman, stop him. Silence them. And remove the opportunity and the microphone from them so they don't teach first. Oh, they say, no, that's not my area. You know, I, I just come here to teach. I want you to talk, oh, I'm not a disciplinarian. I'm not to stop that and stop that. You will ruin the work of God. Jesus said, nevertheless, notwithstanding, I have a few things against you because you permit your love. Thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself. You didn't call it, call her. You didn't appoint her. And you allow people that you have not appointed by the leading of the Spirit to do whatever they want. Calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Preacher, let me ask you. You're preaching the truth. You're emphasizing the truth. You're laboring on the truth. You're preaching almost every day. But after you have preached, your word has no effect in the hearts and the minds of the people. There is a Jezebel somewhere. There is a Balaam somewhere that is polluting the whole congregation and is influencing them. And the Jezebel or the Balaam has more influence on the minds of the people than you're preaching. You're wasting your life. If your life is going to be useful and profitable, you must go beyond preaching. When you finish your preaching, you check up any Balaam there silencing. 
and Jezebel there silence her. But if you just say, well, I'm just going to preach. You know, if you, if you are disciplining people, people will not love you. I just want to be a father, indulgent father, Eli. If you're going to be a father, be a father that cherishes the truth and loves the truth and appreciates the truth and establishes the truth. Not only that, and you enforce the truth. There's no point preaching the truth if you're not going to enforce it. There's no point establishing the truth if you're not going to enforce it. Don't just be an indulgent father, a loving father, a careless father, an Eli, and then the judgment of God will come upon you. Not because you have sinned personally, but because you look at those children of nine and Phineas. And he pollutes the service of the Lord. But I just a wishy washy back, a person that has no backbone. You cannot stand for what you believe. And silence those Jezebels. Then the judgment of God comes upon you. We will stand. I said we will stand. That when you see error coming from any direction, any Jezebel, no matter their stature, no matter their authority, that Jezebel from tonight will be silenced. Yeah. And then it says in verse 21, and I gave a space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed. And them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill this Jesus, loving Jesus, but now it's judge. This is our Savior, this is our Lord, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But he hates falsehood. And that's why he's standing now in the place of the judge of the Lord of the King. And he says, I will kill our children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he that searches the reins on the hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Already now you'll see that the false prophets will be judged. And then those who are, if you are not a false prophet, but there's a false prophet or false prophetess that is uh, ministering and preaching under your leadership. And you know that they are bringing error, evil, worldliness, sin, adultery, fornication, witchcraft. You know it, but you are too much of a coward to speak. The judgment you that comes upon those false teachers and false prophets will also come upon you. But I pray God will deliver you. We're coming to this study now. We're looking at the destiny of false prophets and their followers. We we'll divide the message to three parts. Number one, the frightening delusion of the followers of false prophets. The frightening delusion of the followers of the false prophets. Number two, the final destiny of flattered false prophets. Number three, the future the mission of filthy, fruitless people. Number one, the frightening delusion of followers of false prophets. Delusion. What does that mean? You see, sometimes a person comes to the point where he cannot distinguish between colors. He's losing his eyesight. And green and brown, they look alike to him. Red and purple, they look alike to him. White and gray, they look alike to him. He cannot differentiate anymore between the colors. His, uh, his mind is getting wicked. He cannot tell between right and wrong. And then his brain is losing its memory. It cannot tell between what God said and what the people are saying. And the man is losing his mind. He cannot tell what is from the book of the Proverbs or what is coming from the Proverbs of the world. It cannot make any difference anymore. The delusion that people become so short-sighted 
They become so dim in their sight and they become almost blind. They cannot tell. And the delusion came upon them because they started by overlooking the truth. Overlooking what is essential. Have you noticed it in your life before? If you don't practice it, but you know, if you, if you saw something the first time, it will shock you. But if you tell yourself, why do I allow that to shock me? That's none of my business. Let them do what they want to do. Let me do what I'm going to do. And then you turn away. When you see the next time, you also tell yourself, well, why does that bother me? And then they do it again. You say, why does that bother me? It will come to a point, whenever you see it, it will not bother you again. I I'm asking you now, if you're reading the papers, and you know, you're sure read the newspapers, know what's going on in your country. And sometimes you open the paper when you are very young. And in the search, there was a robbery somewhere. There was murder somewhere. And he killed somebody. And you see the picture on, in the paper. The first time you saw that, you lose your appetite. You'll not be able to eat. The next time when you see that again in the papers, it will bother you, but not like originally. But today, after you've seen it 10 times, 100 times in newspapers, you open the papers and they say that, you know, there's a plane crash and 57 people died. You just read it and then you pass on to the next page. It doesn't have any effect on your mind anymore. That's how the mind works. If you see evil and you just overlook it and just say, just accept it, and say that's none of my business, it comes to a point your conscience becomes hardened. And it doesn't matter to you anymore. And it's like, you know, something is going on in your community. And they're shouting. He has killed him, he has killed him. And you're hearing shouting. The first time when you came to the city and you had that, you couldn't sleep for the rest of the night. And But you've had that over and over and over. That after you've had that now, and five minutes after the gunshots have come down, they just roll over your bed and, you know, you asleep. Before you couldn't sleep the whole night if you had anything like that. And that's the problem of the mind. Don't allow evil and error, false doctrine, to become so familiar to you that you don't mind anymore. It brings delusion. We're looking at Matthew chapter 13, verse 15. Matthew chapter 13, we're looking at verse 15. Yeah, it says in verse 15, For these people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. That's how they come to delusion. Those false prophets, and the followers of the false prophets, they see things like this, black and white, very, very clear. They just close their eyes. And then it says, lest at any time they shall see with their eyes and hear with their ears and shall understand with their hearts and shall be converted and I should heal them. The people that deliberately close their minds to watch, they should know. And they say, no, that's none of my concern. I don't want to think about that. I don't want to see that. And then they block the truth away from their minds. Eventually, they come to delusion. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 8. Now go, write it before them in a table, and note it in a book, that it may be for the time to come forever and ever, but that this is a rebellious people. Lying children. Children that will not hear the law of the Lord. It's, it's a matter of the will, of the mind. That's how people become used to false doctrine. You know, sometimes a person has been in a church like this for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. And, you know, except maybe one or two, one or two Mondays in those 20 years, never miss the Bible study. I'll be coming and coming. I studied the Bible with us from cover to cover. All of a sudden, maybe there's a sick child or a sick wife or oppression somewhere or a loss of job or something that happened. And then begin to think about that calamity, that problem, that pain, that suffering, that joblessness or that whatever it is. And then he begins, his mind begins to go to another place. And then he goes to another church. The first time he goes there and he sees all those people and how they were doing the service, it almost irritated him. 
And he almost said, what am I doing here? This is terrible. And then the preacher, the, the preacher came and the preacher just told some stories and then everybody get up and then he was watching, it was straight to him. And begin to shake yourself, shake, shake, shake. And shake all the causes and all the calamities and all the evil and all the joblessness, shake it away. And the women shake and shake and their scalp come this way and that way. And the man, you know, for the first time he got there, he was looking at them. Why are these people doing like this? They're shaking and shaking. By the time these people finish, they're going to have a headache. And then, uh, you know, after that, uh, after they are shaking and shaking, then the uh, man on the pulpit said, all right now, right now, all those things are shaking them away. They have gone. Amen, amen. And then they go back home. And then he begins to think, that place I went to today, what kind of service was that? Those people, no preaching. It's not like where I'm coming from. But shame will not allow him to come back here because he was, where did you go? And then he goes again. And then these people that shook so much in the last service and the preacher said, now praise the Lord of shaking everything away. All of a sudden, the preacher comes up and says, hey, everybody now, you will shake all the evil away from your life. I thought you shook it away last time. Why is the shaking again? And the shake and shake and shake. All of a sudden, our, let me still call him our brother, he began to shake. And then after that, but he didn't shake like all the other people. You know, he's getting used to it now. Then he goes back again. By the time he spends three months there, he'll be the champion shaker. <laughs> A shake, you'll not believe your eyes. Because now he's used to it. It's not good to be used to false doctrine, false appearance, and false performance. And all the false activities they do in those places. Don't get used to evil. Come out. Beware of false prophets. Where did Jesus tell any of the people to shake like that? Where did the apostles tell any of those people to shake like that? Where do we find it in the New Testament in the Bible? Shake, 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 and all that. That's falsehood. And you know, many people are not telling us the truth. But you come here, you'll hear the truth. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that will wipe all those things away. It's not the shaking. And then it is what he has done that has redeemed us from the curse of the law. It is not the shaking. Can you shake the devil away? Can you shake demons away? Can you shake bad luck away? Look at those people who have been going to such places for seven years and ten years. They have been shaking for those ten years. Those things are still there. Why don't you come? And then see that when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you put up your shield of faith. And then it says, the shield of faith will quench all the fiery darts of the evil one, of the devil. Not shaking, it is faith. And so, there are people that just close their eyes to the truth. Look at, look at it now in verse 10. It says, which say to the seers, see not. And to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. You see, there are people, they get used to the evil and to the deceit, the deception, the false doctrine. And they say, that's what we want. That's our choice. Give it to us. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 44, verse 16. Jeremiah chapter 44. And I'm reading from verse 16. As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. That's real delusion. They knew it was from the word of the Lord. And they said, Jeremiah, keep your doctrine. Keep your message. Keep your truth. Keep your salvation. Keep all those things you are talking about. Yes, we know. We know the chapter and the verse. As for the word that thou hast spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. But in verse 17, we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouths. That's deception. That's delusion. 
their consciences had become totally hardened. What's the attitude of God to such people? When somebody gets to the point that he says, yes, I know the truth, don't tell me again. I know what you are talking about. I don't want to hear. I know where you are going, but don't waste your time. I'm not going to hear. What's the attitude of God to such people? Romans chapter 1, I'm reading verse 28. Romans chapter 1, we're looking at verse 28. You see the attitude of the Lord to the people that make up their minds. Yes, they know that's the truth, but they don't want to hear. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. And you know, there are people that may even come to church over here, and the things they hear, oh, they say, well, I knew they were going to say that. I don't like that. I don't accept that. I'm not going to do that. Look at the verse. I said, that's not for me. You see, what will God do? It says in number 28, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. That's the danger. When somebody knows that this is the truth, and the false prophets are getting to him, and he loves what the false prophets are saying, and he rejects the sound teaching of the word of God. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. In Second Thessalonians chapter 2, we're reading from verse 9. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan. With all power and signs and lying wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth. You know, you have to love the truth before it will benefit you. You have to appreciate the truth before it will benefit you. But if there's something in your heart, either against the person that is speaking the truth, that's why you need to appreciate your leaders in the local church. That's why you need to appreciate your coordinators and group coordinators and overseers in the local church. Because if you have something against them before you even came to church, that's why you should never have any negative discussion between you and your wife, you and your husband, you and the children. You don't know much hurt. You do to your children. If you ever discuss our leaders, our coordinators, group coordinators, and overseers in the presence of your children, those children are sharp. You understand what you're saying? And then when they get to church and our leaders are preaching to them, they cannot listen because we have totally stamped over those leaders. And you hurt yourself by doing that. They will not have any love for the preacher of the truth. Neither will they have any love for the truth that that preacher is preaching. And then it says in that verse 10, that they might be saved. And for this cause in verse 11, God shall send them strong delusion that they shall believe a lie. Because there's no love for the truth. Then God will send them strong delusion that they shall believe a lie. Look up here. And you know why sometimes we say, and we wonder why our people, they have problems and they are not solved and they have uh, difficulties, they are not removed. And, you know, we go to the Thursday revival hour and then our preachers, they preach. Are they not quoting from the same Bible the pastor is quoting from? Are they not emphasizing the same name of Jesus and the same power of this unchanging, immutable what Yes, they are. You know, when I, when I come by the grace of God, it's not just because of what I say. It's because when I come and open those walls and I say, God will heal you today. You say, yes, amen, we believe. Because you believe. That's why. Not because of my name, not because it's me saying it, but when you get your district, if you, are, if you are kind of downgraded, belittled, and you have a kind of a felt that all those coordinators, who are they? What can they do? Anything they preach, you are just there. 
you do not have you don't love them and because you don't love and appreciate them the things they preach will be common to you that's why you'll find if you check up very well a stranger comes to the church a newcomer comes to the church that newcomer is sick but he doesn't know our preacher. He doesn't know that this, uh, you know, the GS or that is uh, region overseer or that is state overseer or that's group coordinator, that's coordinator. The, the stranger, the newcomer doesn't know the difference between any of them, any of us. And then this person comes and he preaches the word of God and he says right there, the word of God is coming to you now. Faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The Lord is touching you now because of you know him the person preaching and you don't respect him and you don't have any love for him or what he says uh, just see down there the newcomer that didn't know anything negative about him and immediately the preacher said raise up your hand he raised up his hand touch yourself he touches himself claim it now you are getting healed now all of a sudden the healing comes and the people that come out to say praise the lord i was healed when the message was going on, if it's a retreat in the morning, you'll find most of those people are newcomers. They are the people that do not know our preachers. Are we not hurting ourselves by acting too familiar with our preachers? Are we not hurting ourselves by belittling them? Are we not hurting ourselves by not having the love for the truth? But if you love the truth and say it doesn't matter who else is preaching it, senior pastor or junior pastor, doesn't matter to me. The word of God is the word of God. This word of God will do good in your life. But if we come to the deception, if we come to the delusion that then we don't have the love for the truth, it will be a pity. I pray it will never happen to you. I'm reading from verse 10 again for you to get a feel of what I'm talking about. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned, who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. I pray that the Lord will give us the love for the truth in Jesus' name. Point number two now, the final destiny of flattered false prophets. The false prophets, although everybody is flattering them, appreciating them, exalting them, what's the final destiny? Here we learn from Matthew chapter 7 verse 19. Matthew chapter 7, we're looking at verse 19. It says, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, is cut down, and cast into the fire. The destiny of false prophets. And a lot here was talking about the false prophets when he said, the tree that does not bring forth good fruit. That means it's bringing forth evil fruit, corrupt fruit, carnal fruit, sinful fruit worldly fruit followers. And as you look at Matthew chapter 3, you'll find us exactly what John had told the people, John the Baptist, in, in Matthew chapter 3 verse 10. And now also, the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. The axe, that's the axe of judgment. That's the axe of the wrath of God. That's the act of the final damnation for the people who are adamant in their sin, in their evil. The acts of judgment, of damnation and condemnation. That acts is laid on the root of all the trees. Therefore, every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down, cut down, and cast into the fire. You know, it's so clear from the word of God. And that's why, you know, you don't want to flatter people, flatter anybody that is, you know, not doing right, not preaching well, not preaching some doctrine, even a relative, a husband, a wife. You know, sometimes your husband might uh, say, you know, my wife, I didn't want to tell you this before, but... I see that my talents are not being well used here. 
And I see that if I branch out to, you know, do another thing and to just establish a ministry, you know what? I feel that my ministry will really break out very well. And I didn't want to tell you before, but now I have a new name for that ministry I've been talking about. And if you just say, okay, that's all right, we're going together, and you make your husband to be lost, to come under condemnation. Watch all those people. They have a new ministry. They want to have a breakthrough. They want to build this and build that. Wife, come on, join me. Watch them. They establish this new thing. And then they cannot stand upon the truth. They cannot keep on emphasizing the truth. They want a crowd. And because they want a crowd, they do not have the stamina or the backbone to be able to stand on this unchanging word of God. And you, are, you can be of hell by saying, my husband, I'm not going anywhere. Here is where the truth is preached without fear, without favor. Some of the people who are state overseers today, they were our fellowship leaders before. Your time will come. Just stay where you are. If you stay here, I'll stay with you. If you go anywhere, sir, you go alone. I'm staying here. If you do that, the man may go, but they'll be saying, where is your wife? Where is your wife? And then he would, he would say, my wife is not coming because, you know, we were deep alive. Ah, if your wife will not come, we cannot trust you, cannot be with you. Your staying will be a magnet that will bring the husband back. But if you just encourage them and say, okay, let us go. And then you get into false doctrine, the damnation at the end of the day. The evil that will be done. And the judgment that will come at the end of the day, when there will be no remedy, that's, the, that's why it, it pays stay where you are. You are not here for position. You are not here for, you know, this title and this authority and that. Whatever the Lord wants you to be, you will be. I said you will be. You know, sometimes there are people, they're too much in a hurry. And, you know, even they tell us Rome was not built in a day. You don't become a bishop, but bishop in a day. An overseer in a day. Stay. And whatever you have now that you are doing, stay there. And if the Lord wants in a higher position, that position will come. And so don't encourage people that will say, I want to go and do, I to go and do this. Because of the damnation that comes upon people that just jump like that. And then they might jump into error, falsehood, damnation, condemnation, judgment, wrath to come. Matthew chapter 23, verse 15. Matthew chapter 23, verse 15. Want to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, one disciple, one follower. And when he is made, Ye make him to fold more the child of hell than yourselves. That means that those preachers were children of hell. And their converts too, they become children of hell. But then they become to fold more the child of hell. In verse 33, ye serpents and ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Ye vipers. That means that their nature was evil. And these were preachers, the preachers of the day. And Jesus said, ye vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Second Peter, reading from chapter 2, verse 1. Second Peter, chapter 2. Reading there from verse 1. Second Peter 2, 1. But there were false prophets also among the people. Even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately, privately, secretly shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves, what kind of destruction? Sweet destruction. Bring upon themselves. And many shall follow their pernicious ways. And this tells us another thing. You know, some people will say, but... That church is growing. 
If they are not standing on the truth, how can they be growing like that? You have not read your Bible of late. I don't want to mention churches. But churches grow. Whatever churches, whatever church they are. And the largest church in this country is the Catholic Church. Are we going to say that because the Catholic Church is the largest church in this country, therefore, the totality of the truth is there? The Jehovah's Witnesses, they're very large. Are we going to say, because they have many followers, that means that they're preaching the truth? The white garment churches are very large. Don't be deceived by numbers. It's not the number. When Jesus came over here in this world, the Pharisees had large followings. But Jesus Christ was the truth, the personification of the truth. And then after he rose from the dead, how many people saw him? Just a little more than 500 people. And on the day of Pentecost, only 120. So don't be fooled by large numbers. Because it says in that verse 2, it says that many shall follow their pernicious ways. By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with vain words make merchandise of you. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, does it? Their judgment lingereth not. And their damnations lumbereth not. Verse 9. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust, to reserve the sinner, to reserve the backslider, and to reserve the adamant prodigal son, and to reserve the false prophet, the unjust, unto the day of judgment to be punished. And he tells us in verse 17, these are wells, Without water, whether the water of life, and clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. You don't want to be in a case like that. That these people who are not preaching the truth, who do not know the truth, who are not emphasizing the truth, who cannot stand uncompromisingly for the truth, wishy washy, no backbone. And they're like jellyfish, amphibians, neither in nor out. And they cannot put their feet down on what is true and declare the truth without fear, without favor. It says the damnation of hell is reserved for them to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. In Jude, I'm reading from verse 4. You have received the message from our pastor, Pastor W.F. Kumoye the General Superintendent of the Parallel Bible Church. It is my wish that as you listen, you accept the old world and you will let them sink into the, your hearts. And by the grace of the Lord, you will never regret it. It is my prayer that by next week, when our, our pastor shall come up again to present another message, you will be there, your family will be there, and your friends. And I believe as you are listening to the message every week, by the grace of the Lord, you will never be the same. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, O oh Lord, because of today's message. We thank you, O oh Lord, because of the one you let us listen to last week and the one we are going to listen to the next week by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. If we tarry, we shall listen together once again next week. And if not, every one of us will be there with you in the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because you are the Lord that answers prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.